hosting uh, Sumit Chintala from Meta to discuss PyTorch as a project and the PyTorch Foundation. Um, so let's kick it off with a uh, basic introduction. Um, I'll start with myself. I run LFAI and data at the Linux Foundation, uh, and as recently as a week ago, the PyTorch Foundation. Um, I focus on supporting open source projects in the AI and data domain and enabling innovation and development in these projects. And with us is uh, Sumit Chintala. Sumit, I'll pass the mic to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Ibrahim. Hello, everyone. I'm Sumit. I've been working within the PyTorch community for, for the last six plus years. And um, we're pretty excited to make it part of the part of an independent foundation. I've personally been in AI for the last 12 to 15 years. Um, that's, that's it. Maybe we should just get started. Okay, thank you. So two weeks ago, Meta and the Linux Foundation announced the transition of PyTorch, the open source project, to the Linux Foundation under the umbrella of the newly established PyTorch Foundation. And I think to structure this conversation around kind of three parts, the first one is in relation to the PyTorch project itself. The second one is in relation to transitioning the project to the Linux Foundation under the PyTorch Foundation umbrella. And the third part is in relation to kind of what next now that the project sits in a neutral umbrella foundation. So let's kick it off with kind of the first part of the discussion. Uh, and I thought um, there's a lot of interest in AI, a lot of interest in PyTorch as the largest AI framework by uh, interest and in development activities. Uh, maybe just give us an introduction, uh, Sumit, on the history of the PyTorch project, your involvement with it, and, you know, Meta has done an incredible work in terms of growing the PyTorch community. So maybe you can give us kind of a history of, of that, that led us to the point of, you know, where we are today with the PyTorch Foundation. Sure, it sounds good. Um, it all started uh, actually back in 20... 11 or so, where we had a project called Torch, which was a predecessor to PyTorch um, that was written in Lua. It's called Torch 7. It, it, it still exists. Um, and Torch 7, I started using it, eventually started maintaining it. And there are a bunch of people from the Torch community who were also AI scientists at various places. And then we would be the responsible for developing and improving Torch. Eventually what happened was Torch uh, started getting a little bit outdated. I mean, science is like this, like you have new tools in a few years, they become old tools because uh, the ideas that are being expressed are, are different uh, than they used to be. And so we were thinking about how to get Torch into a new era, and so we ripped out the back end of Torch, uh, and then we put a new front end to it that was written in Python that was inspired by Chainer and Torch Autograd and various other packages at that time. And we called it PyTorch, and, and we released it in 2017. And it was, it was pretty centrally a community-driven project. As I mentioned, it was a bunch of us from the Torch community who came together to, to build this. And uh, PyTorch, uh, over the first few years, uh, one of the great things that happened to it was Meta invested a lot of resources and uh, funding for people uh, into PyTorch itself. And Meta also started noticing that it wasn't really properly registered or run, uh, and Meta started securing PyTorch's uh, ownership structure in a more formal, healthy way that you would want for a sustainable open source project. And as we grew PyTorch, uh, in parallel, Meta was cleaning up the, the these. And then eventually the plan was that once we have the house in order to, to get this to an independent foundation, and that's how we ended up with PyTorch uh, started kicking off into the Linux Foundation as an independent foundation. Um, 
we continue to be largely driven by a multiple set of people um, across many companies and universities and uh, independent people. And we have about 2,500 contributors and uh, 300,000 plus downloads a day just on the PyPy channel uh, and a lot more uh, in aggregate. So that's that's roughly the summary of how it started, where we stand, and how we came about. Thank you. So one of the very interesting aspects of the project um, is the community itself. You know, I work at the Linux Foundation, been there for a long time, and we do support our projects to build kind of communities, and that takes a lot of efforts. Uh, and it's really, really uh, distinguished that the project PyTorch has around 24, 2,500 active contributors. Uh, it is a dependency for uh, tens of thousands of projects on GitHub. It's been deployed and being used by thousands of organizations. Uh, you know, when you look back at the journey in the past six, seven years, um, you know, what would be your maybe two or three kind of top advices in terms of what can we do as uh, companies to start a project and grow it, kind of following the success and lessons learned from uh, the PyTorch project. You know, basically what what helped you in building such a, an awesome community around the project? I think there is no one size fits all. First, uh, open source primarily, if you recognize open source is not fundamentally driven by commercial incentives. People aren't like, oh, I want to make money, so I'm going to do open source. So open source is done uh, as a, almost like a passion. Like it feels like the right thing to do because of some intrinsic motivation, right? So I think uh, I can't give a playbook for how companies should do open source because it's not in the incentives of a company to actually do open source unless it's strategically relevant for them. So there are companies that are built around open source uh, for security re like reasons or you know, various other factors, but generally this is not true. So let me start with that, right? Like I think if your company is doing open source, for whatever reason, because some people within the company are passionate about open source or it's important to a company, like let's take that as a given. But beyond that, I think like engaging uh, with, with the open source community in general just needs like a change in mindset. So if you're a company with physical offices, uh, it is very real that you're going to be able to communicate with a much higher effective bandwidth to your colleagues than to your open source contributors mm -hmm. who are, are not within your company. So that generally plays a big factor in uh, in like in creating a tiered world or not creating a tiered world of contributions uh, where some people just naturally because of the bandwidth available person to person you get, just get priority over many things uh, and the other people will get discouraged. So like, I think having that um, remote first mentality, like we're being very comfortable with long form textual communication and uh, um, understanding that a bunch of contributors are not within the same tooling and stack as the contributors in your company within your tooling. I think that's a very important aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, and setting the culture early to counter this effectively, I think will help you scale your, your open source efforts greatly because uh, contributors that are not at your company will feel like they are really part of the project and not just driving by. The other thing is open source generally doesn't come for free. Like uh, one of the common things that people do is they they develop something internally to their company and then they just throw it over the wall. They're like, oh, cool. Like this is now open source. This is my gift to the world. Like art isn't every other made, right? The truth is 
um, the needs of the product and the product building within your company are likely to be very different from the needs of people outside who are using your product. So um, I always say like, think about an overhead of 30 to 40%. If you really want to passionately grow this project open source, if you have 10 people, uh, you should probably think about people's time percentage as like they're going to spend 30 to 40 percent of the time on open source and I don't mean you assign four people to do open source and six people to do like your product internally I mean every person individually will allocate like a significant portion of time and understanding how this product is used outside of your company in open source and then maybe you know crafting and building towards that as well so those, are, I think, are the two main things I would uh, flag as things people can learn from. Yeah, thank you. And I fully agree. In fact, um, just as an example, when I used to be an engineering uh, manager for open source at Samsung Research, my advice to my team members is even if you're sitting in the same office, you want to talk to the engineer sitting next door, don't just do that, you know, use the common open source project channels so that everyone is aware and to build that sense of community. So certainly I, um, I kind of understand and um, support the idea you, you shared with us on this. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the project growth, at the same time, you are kind of building the project at Meta as an open source project. You also were using it internally. Have you exchanged, have you kind of, uh, Pass through times where you had different challenges in terms of you know scaling, in terms of uh, technical governance, in terms of relationship with partners who are also using the project. You know what are some of the challenges uh, you have experienced as the project, you know the open source project was becoming extremely popular, both in academia and also in in the corporate and enterprise world. Yeah, so I think. Uh... In terms of, there were a few challenges, but like the first I would try to cover is in terms of scaling, right? So the project was started by about 18 people out of which two people were working full-time and everyone else was working after they tucked their kids in, in bed, <laughs> like in the night or like basically like part-time passion project, right? So first, Thing that came about as PyTorch became way more popular than Torch ever was. So uh, we were just generally overwhelmed by a number of GitHub issues or PR or things like that. Uh, one of the things we tried to do was try to be heroic about this. So we were like, oh, we're going to work harder and better and more efficiently, and we're going to get that GitHub issue count to zero, and we're going to implement all the features that people ever wanted and this is going to be amazing. And the truth is that was just not possible. I was reading 400 to 500 GitHub notifications every day and replying to everyone and like, and working like 14, 15, 16 hours a day. Um, at some point, like, we started realizing that we were being idiots about this. Like this, it's just not possible. Um, so we started actually prioritizing things. So, I mean, that's just something that if you're scaling, you're going to come to terms with. It doesn't matter how, like, it doesn't, if your project is scaling exponentially and your, your team size is scaling linearly, like you're just going to lose by, by definition. So we started prioritizing and triaging things and like realizing that we will only be able to work on some things and try to work on the most impactful things pretty much. So yeah. you, like, I think like 2,500 contributors is obviously like a big number, but like the sustained dedicated contributors is a much smaller number, right? Probably closer to like 400 or 500. Um, and getting these people productively doing things that matter. I think that is just a big process. And like Edward Yang, one of another PyTorch core maintainers, right, wrote a blog post about how we operationalize and scale PyTorch. Um, 
about technical governance and the, the friction or anything like that. Honestly, over the years, PyTorch and the community of contributors and maintainers have had such high trust within each other that we did not really face this problem. Uh, we, we were always on the same page. Like even the PyTorch had like, like Meta has the biggest team, but like there's Nvidia, Microsoft, there's various people from like various places. And we always were on the same page with each other. Um, even as Meta started cleaning up things. So for example, PyTorch on the website just said, oh, just copyright PyTorch contribute or something. And then eventually it, Meta made the changes to say copyright Meta open source. Uh, people didn't really say, oh, what the hell is going on? Why aren't you, like, we were always on the same page. We knew that we were all working towards the same goal. So there was no misunderstanding as such. And I think I'm fairly blessed that we were like that and we didn't have partner disagreements and various things like that. Um, I think uh, I just wanted to cover one other part. Like as PyTorch scaled, it is generally like an important problem to think about like the, mm, the money, like where you get the money for resources, right? Like PyTorch's continuous integration, just like your unit tests on every PR and stuff, just the budget for that is seven figures. Uh, maybe like, you know, in the, like some years uh, was even closer to eight figures. So uh, just genuinely this kind of money for resources and stuff, I think is something as, as, the, as the lead maintainer of the project, I have to think of all kinds of creative ways of funding PyTorch and all of that. And I'm really blessed that Meta unilaterally just supported uh, most of these requests, but uh, you also generally have to think about when you have a project, keep it balanced. Like you can't just have a single source of funding and a single point of failure. You, you have to try to balance it out. And so over the years, we try to encourage uh, many other companies to come in, join in, NVIDIA, Microsoft, AMD, uh, Amazon, um, Hugging Face, um, Lightning. They all are like starting, uh, like they've, they've contributed over the years, have sustained teams around PyTorch. So that's something as well that I think you should think about when, when you're growing your open source project. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually kind of, a great segue into the second part where we talk about the PyTorch Foundation. So Meta invested a lot, they created the project, they grew it to become you know, the fantastic project, the big community today. Uh, in the process, you face different challenges. Uh, and today, or a couple of weeks ago, the project started its transition to the PyTorch Foundation under the Linux Foundation. Um, so in your own word and, you know, communicating that to the people watching us today, uh, and I see some questions as well, and to the people who would listen to this, you know, in your own word, you know, how would you describe the PyTorch Foundation for the kind of the listener out there who's interested in PyTorch and maybe an existing contributor? Sure. Yeah, I think there's a lot of confusion as to what the PyTorch Foundation is and what it entails. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the Q&A as well, which are, trying to understand what the foundation means uh, and will the employees work on internal meta like uh, so let me try to clarify quickly so the PyTorch foundation stashes all of the assets uh, and basically what i mean by assets is like logo and github organization and things like that of PyTorch. so they own the copyright the the brand uh, and stuff. Uh, the PyTorch Foundation is at the moment not really like, oh, we took, we, the, it doesn't have employees funded to contribute to PyTorch. Like there are various companies who are funding teams to work on PyTorch and that will continue. Um, the foundation makes sure the brand PyTorch is not in one one centralized company's control and that the brand is itself 
equitably uh, votable, like the, the decisions on the brand are votable on, among uh, all the board members. Um, the technical governance of fight words. So like, you would think, oh, okay, cool. This all sounds good. So these five partners, uh, can they tell who will be the next maintainer or who will, what features should be implemented? Like, can these five companies come in and say, oh, implement this, implement that? That's not uh, true either. So the PyTorch Foundation is going to hold the business governance of PyTorch. And then there is the technical governance of PyTorch. And technical governance, uh, I mean, contributing to PyTorch, the maintaining PyTorch, like having right access to the PyTorch code base, figuring out what features to build next, what to prioritize. All of the technical governance is completely separate and is given to individuals. It is not given to companies uh, based on how much they invested in the PyTorch Foundation or anything like that. So as an individual, you get, you, you're given maintainer status. And um, a lot of these individuals are at Meta, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and, and that's a natural consequence of the fact that these individuals were contributing to PyTorch and eventually they were looking for a full-time opportunity and these companies were offering um, opportunities to work on PyTorch full-time. Uh, but even if they leave any of these companies, they will still have right access and they will still like continue working on PyTorch if they feel like it. Um, I think that's like, that's like an important uh, yeah. point to make here. Uh, and I think it's very similar to how the, the Linux as a project is held within the Linux Foundation uh, as well, like how it's run overall and it's, yeah. It's technical governance. Yes, excellent. So, so I will summarize uh, there because there, there was a lot to unpack. Uh, so basically, as a summary, the PyTorch Foundation is basically a foundation, an entity that holds the project assets. And these assets, as uh, Sumit mentioned, they include the website, GitHub org, any social media accounts, the trademark of the project, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the foundation acts as a funding body for the project. So when the project wants to spend money on, uh, you know, cloud resources, on infrastructure, um, on uh, events, et cetera, et cetera, it is the foundation that offers the funding for the project. And um, again, as Sumit mentioned, there is a clear separation of governance. Um, so basically, there is the technical governance, which is how the project development happens. And this is completely separate and independent from how the foundation operates. So a member in the foundation cannot go and say, hey, can you please accept this pull request or anything like that? You know, the members of the foundation are there to provide funding and support for the project. And, you know, the technical uh, development happens completely in, in, in an independent way following the uh, project's uh, technical governance. Uh, and this is the model that we apply in all of our projects and all of our umbrella foundations uh, within the next foundation. For instance, I run LFA and data, and we have exactly the same model. We have the foundation governance, and every project we host have their own uh, separate uh, technical governance. Um, and it works extremely, extremely well. And we're able to gather and raise funds for the project, for the project's needs, and um, it's a successful model to work with. Uh, so and I think uh, Sumit, now that you know we kind of identified you know what's the PyTorch Foundation, what does it do? Uh, I think uh, a very interesting question uh, that I'm pretty sure people are thinking of is you know what is the impact of that transition? You know, transitioning the project uh, into the foundation has on the development activities. Now I know the answer, but I'd like you kind of to highlight that uh, to our audience today. So yeah, transitioning the the project into the foundation doesn't really change developer activities at all. Like everything remains mm -hmm. roughly the same. Uh, it's just been in, in in some sense we've done the tech technical debt cleanup of the organization, right? So like we we've basically been doing all of what we were doing without really formalizing it, without really writing it down anywhere. For example, our technical governance was never codified uh, in the project's bylaws or anything like that. And now like, I think we roughly have a structure 
we have a, like a very clear understanding uh, and a lot more transparency in how we're taking decisions and that like for every critical decision we make, we would actually post the, the uh, how we took the decision, the notes and stuff publicly. But that's roughly, um, I think, improving. So nothing really changes directionally. It's just that we're just gonna be operating a lot more uh, structured and transparently. Yeah, thank you. And, and actually, I get that question a lot when I interact with organizations, uh, especially startup. On, um, you know, when we host our project with the foundation, how's that going to impact the workflow of our developer or the activities? And my answer is no impact. You know, the only change you might see is just that you have to be more persistent in applying the open governance versus you know just taking it ad hoc. Uh, so there is a question I'd like to address. Um, you know, um, does it mean now that the foundation employees won't work on internal meta tasks or will it be to separate jobs for them? So uh, today there's myself who's kind of considered a, a foundation employee. I act as the uh, executive director or the manager of the foundation. Uh, I do not work for Meta. I work for the Linux Foundation. Um, my paycheck comes from the Linux Foundation and I am a resource in support of the foundation activities. Uh, basically, uh, I work to support the project. I'm responsible for uh, bringing fund in, in supporting the requests of the project uh, when it comes to marketing activities, uh, any activities in relation to their trademark, any activities that require support. Uh, I'm responsible to help the project execute on, on that support and fulfill it. Um, so to address the question, um, you know, none of the foundation people for Met, work for Meta or for any other foundation members. Uh, we work for the next foundation in support uh, of the PyTorch project directly. Um, and um, there's uh, the last question that I see here is the PyTorch Foundation uh, structure will be public. It is a, a nonprofit organization. It is a public organization. Uh, and already all the maintainers and members of the project, uh, the roadmap, everything is and was already public. So there is no change there. Um, all of that information is available from the PyTorch GitHub account or GitHub org. And also, if you go to PyTorch.org, which is kind of the main entry to the project, uh, you can find uh, all that information available uh, from the website as well. Um, yeah, the, so the main, I just want to say the maintainer list is available in the PyTorch documentation in the page persons of interest and there is a page called governance or technical governance that describes the structure of the technical governance as well it's again in the PyTorch documentation exactly and you know one of the impressive things i found about the project is the abundance of documentation uh, obviously there has been a lot of work put into this uh, so um so Matt, if you are to give advice uh, to people who are interested in getting involved in the project, but it is a very massive project, a lot of pieces, different building elements, and it might be a little bit intimidating uh, kind of to, to start. What advice would you give them on how to get involved and you know how to get started? Yeah, I think uh, the first step is to use PyTorch. Uh, I think if you're interested in PyTorch itself, then use it uh, and build something cool with it, build a project on top of PyTorch. Right now, for example, there's 150,000 projects uh, who build on top of PyTorch and have registered so on GitHub saying that. Uh, but out of them, obviously, the, the valuable ones are maybe hundreds of them, right? Like, I think you genuinely can help the PyTorch community by building something valuable and interesting and cool for and within the PyTorch community. That would be, I think, your first gateway uh, entry into the PyTorch community where you feel like you are a good community member and other people are appreciating what you're doing. Uh, actually, the core PyTorch project itself, most people, wouldn't need to or want to or have to contribute, but if you are inclined to, then we have a contributing.md page and also uh, we uh, like in, in the PyTorch thing, there's a 
uh, Markdown page for contributing. Uh, that's a good thing to read. But also we have issues that are marked as good first issues. So if you actually search our issues for uh, the tags in our issues, there is a tag called good first issue and you can um, you can have a look at these issues as like a way to try to enter into the core PyTorch project more gently. We also have a lot of uh, existing peripheral projects within the ecosystem that are always looking for contributions. Um, I think, um, so there's Torch Vision, Torch Audio, Torch Text, Hugging Face, Lightning. They're all like within the PyTorch ecosystem and they're also always looking for contributors. So um, it really depends on what you want to do. And they're all kind of very open and community driven and you should come join in on any of these. Thank you. I, I think the idea to have issues for first time contributor is just fantastic. This is kind of, you know, beyond just using PyTorch, just to be kind of the next step. Hey, you know, now that you've used the project and you have a good idea on how it works, here are some entry points issues that you can start working on if you're interested. Uh, in contributing. Um, there's a question from Alexander Zubian, uh, and I think it fits kind of the progression of the talk today. Um, it's in relation to how uh, the roadmap of the project is being defined and how prioritizing features happen, if you're able to give yeah. us some highlights on this. Yeah, so, so PyTorch uh, is run as a product. Uh, one of the things I would distinctly tell you is there, I talked a lot about how we're going to make decisions fairly transparent and we're going to try to outline what we're doing, but um, what we are not aiming to do, for example, and this is easily confused with each other, is we're not trying to design by committee. We're not trying to say, oh, for what features do we do next? Okay, let's have a committee of people decide that. It's very much a hierarchical product development cycle where like each, each maintainer has opinions on what to prioritize and they get mm -hmm. all rolled up. And then uh, the core maintainers kind of give guidance and stuff like that. We generally have a fairly independent thing here. So feature development, what gets prioritized is, uh, is stuff we generally make public as part of uh, posts like as it's uh as we're developing them so like we have a developer mailing it's called devdiscuss.pytorch.org and over there we routinely post our thinking our roadmap their updates um and uh we're going to increase it like and now we started a monthly maintainers meeting for which we are transparently posting the meeting notes and how we're thinking um and how we actually like, I mean, I told you like the bureaucratic, like, you know, okay, how do we like roughly um, think about the decision-making process? But like to give you like a more concrete answer, uh, PyTorch is always run very pragmatically. We take a holistic view of all of our users, all of our uh, ecosystem and, uh, all the feedback we get from all these channels, from like various kinds of users, various uh, um, other uh, developers within the Python data data science ecosystem, and then we figure out then how best to take the product forward. So roughly, we are a very pragmatic project in that we're not we're not trying to promote a particular technical direction or particular philosophy or particular idea we are very like pragmatic to the feedback loop we have from a variety of our users and that's how we prioritize various features and such thank you um and i i was going to ask you about kind of the relationship uh between pytorch as a project and academia in general because when you know when you look at uh the adoption or the project as being embraced by academia it's being uh, used in universities uh, for, as a teaching uh, tool. It's being um, uh, in published uh, amazing numbers in terms of publications citing PyTorch as the project. Um, so what, what are the characteristics that 
put PyTorch so much ahead of other AI frameworks, specifically in the academia. And follow that's one. And following to on that question, there are a few questions basically on uh, how do you see the research happening in PyTorch after the move to the foundation? Um, that's kind of correlated together. Yeah. Um, I think the academia thing is very interesting. Um, we uh, like, I'll, I'll tell you like why I think we became the standard in academia. Yeah. It might be like comically simple <laughs> in, uh, like, so, so basically, um, we were the first machine learning framework to ship a binary our first deep learning framework to ship a binary that you literally just pip install and it just started working uh, without any without installing any other system packages so uh, all the other packages at the time for example were like oh you installed this version of CUDA on your system you install this version of that software on your system and then you pip install what we have or some of them were like then you build from source uh, what we have so it was like a mix of like packaging troubles. And like we spent a lot of time honing the packaging story. Like that was, I think, in retrospect, like we spent a lot of time on that because we knew from our previous time in Torch and we knew like how, what general pain points people had that people just had trouble even getting going, right? Like that's like the first step. And it's like a simple thing it's not a very interesting to work on for someone yeah. who wants to work on like just feature development or something so and i think this is especially susceptible uh factor for students and academics who who generally don't like if you're an ml developers like ml student right you you don't like you, you don't know fully like building from like build systems um, and building from source and C++ and CUDA and all of that. So I think we just thought about bringing the barrier of entry to users, mm -hmm. making it much lower than it ever was. And it's, it was a combination of packaging, a solid documentation. The third factor, I, I believe strongly, was backward compatibility. You mm -hmm. actually take code from PyTorch 0.3 or 0.4, it still works uh, in the latest PyTorch release. Uh, and people really care about that stability and our competitors. Um, generally, like the way I can tell you is like, when you're in a company, especially a large company, right? You don't care too much about backward compatibility because it, you generally work in a model repo. So if you're making a change, you can make that change for every usage of, your chain like the api within the entire code base of this large company so you don't really want to be held back onto like years and years of backward compatibility so and we fairly counter culture to like meta like uh, said no we just want to be backward compatible for as long as we can like because that's something that a lot of people would care about outside of Meta, but that's like from our open source community. So uh, I think these two or three things, which are not even related to, to PyTorch, the, the, the product in terms of features or whatever, uh, probably mm -hmm. made the barrier of entry and like the, the understanding of stability like a lot better for the, uh, the this this market of academics uh, that you were talking about that and that i think is like a really good reason why it became popular mm -hmm. there's also the ease of use and all of that but i don't like and we're we were like you know good at ease of use and all of that but i i think we weren't the only package that was easy to use at that time so i don't think this is the differentiating factor oh. and uh, actually I listened to your podcast uh, about a couple of weeks ago with Mark Miller. And what I found really interesting in, in relation to this topic is, you know, when you were at a university in, you know, in New York and you were working on Torch and then transitioned to PyTorch, maybe it's kind of in your subconscious that 
as you were working on PyTorch, you were thinking, hey, you know, I want to lower the barrier to enter PyTorch for all the students, <laughs> the ones that you were in similar position with, you know, a few years back. So maybe that kind of the exposure to to Torch and then transitioning to PyTorch as a math, you know, as a university graduate student, you know, helped give you that kind of inspiration to uh, make the project more accessible to academia. It, it wasn't even like that. It was much more simplistic. Um, and I do, I, I'm definitely not a visionary like that. Like I was, my main incentive was to answer less questions on our forums. <laughs> I was <laughs> just like, I'm tired of answering all these install issues questions. Maybe like we should just package better so that we don't get okay. these questions. That, that, was, <laughs> that was how it ran. <laughs> So just a kind of a typical lazy computer scientist. Pretty much. <laughs> so uh, I think one of the interesting questions we have, you know, is when you look at the existing landscape of open source AI frameworks, you know, at any point in time, even today, there's between like 12 to 15 of them. And we track them on our open source AI and data landscape. Um, so, you know, when you look at so many different projects trying to kind of provide solutions within that, deep learning slash machine learning space, you know, how do you see that space changing for the next two, three, four years as, you know, tools become more advanced, tools gain more adoption? You know, what's your um, view on, you know, how that space would look like in a few years from today? Um, I gave a 45 minute talk about this. So I'll try to summarize it more quickly. I think there is, uh, it will like I don't think it's a it's an obvious answer. Like I think it's a distribution of mm -hmm. directions that we can go in because it really depends on like how the AI landscape itself changes. So my my the the summary of my answer is if we if we if we don't need as much of a general AI framework because we've settled on fewer kinds of methods and sets of methods, then we're going to start seeing a lot more specialized and narrower packages that implement these methods, like in terms of like a vertical engine. For example, scikit-learn or XGBoost today are really good at implementing that on our two methods in a very vertically integrated way without you can just use that method and throw your data at it and do a little bit of tuning, but you you can't really customize that method from the scratch. I think like if neural networks and this stuff becomes a lot more specialized and, uh, and consolidated, then we, we're gonna see more of these packages taking over uh, rather than uh, general purpose packages like PyTorch or TensorFlow. Um, we could also see uh, a completely new paradigm show up. Like basically we say, oh, dense tensors, haha, we don't need them anymore because this new uh, ML method uh, is using sparse tensor or like it's just not even using tensor, it's using some kind of trees. Then we're gonna have to reset our expectations on what the ideal package is and uh, a bunch of packages might pop up and try to win over the market. So I, I think, there's also like the third part that I talked about, which is uh, I think ML right now is collaborative on the source code, but not collaborative on the model. So you can't yes. co-develop a model in a distributed fashion. Be like, oh yeah, I made this incremental change to this model. Here's the diff. Like, and someone approves the diff, like and looks at the diff and approves. Like it's, we don't have that in the model part. Like we don't have that in an actively developed model with trained weights, we only have that in the code and structure of the model or like generally just the source code of training. I think if we are able to get further along in how to actively collaborate and co-develop models, um, I think we're gonna open up a big, big, uh, like, like we're gonna see like, the GitHub of ML is going to be very different from GitHub for code, in my opinion. And like, it depends on whether we make progress on understanding how to like do collaborative modeling. Uh, and I think 
there's a lot of effort in getting there, but we're not there yet. So I think these are all things that can happen that will change the landscape. And, and some of them PyTorch survives and some of them PyTorch doesn't. Uh, I think it's TBD <laughs> to be decided. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I think th this goes along kind of the looking at the ecosystem and seeing that a lot of organization see a lot of values in models and the data and the apps built on top and they tend to open source the frameworks and the libraries and the tool beneath that to build communities around them and uh, try to build an ecosystem in support of their uh, apps on, on top of that so it, it actually correlates pretty well uh, so we have a question that might extend to your uh, answer uh, just now uh, summit uh, it may take us a little bit on the technical side but not too deep and the question is, you know, what would be the best fit use case for PyTorch? Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, frameworks and, and, and tools that can be used in, in multiple ways, multiple directions. Uh, but in the case of PyTorch, what would be kind of the most ideal use case that PyTorch uh, kind of was and born to kind of solve such use cases? Yeah, so PyTorch itself, you can think of as first like a, a base uh, framework to do to do state of the art AI research. So PyTorch, I think, is best used when you need a lot of control and uh, rawness in do, building out state of the art neural networks and other differentiable techniques. Um, but there's PyTorch the ecosystem, right? So Py on, on top of PyTorch, there's various products and uh, uh, things that are built that make doing something distinctively easy. So you take, for example, Hugging Face, they built a series of APIs on top of PyTorch that makes it easy to do natural language processing, um, state-of-the-art natural language processing, and like, one or two lines of code, like you, like similar to say scikit learn wrapping in state of the art methods. So I think uh, the, for the core PyTorch foundation, the best use case is if you're doing state of the art uh, AI and you need a lot of control. Um, otherwise, if you're mainly someone who's starting out who doesn't know too much about AI or uh, PyTorch, uh, you're better off starting off with something on built on top of PyTorch that is trying to facilitate um, the more starter friendly things. Uh, maybe I would recommend Hugging Face, for example, but there's a few others like Scorch, uh, which is like a scikit learn like wrapper around PyTorch. Uh, um, I, can, I can recommend um, um, like for depending on the domain, I can recommend things like Cornea or uh, um, like, I think there's like, yeah, it, it really depends on what you are looking to do. There's something within the PyTorch ecosystem that's mm -hmm. probably built on top of PyTorch uh, and that's much more catered to someone who's starting out. Yeah, thank you. Um, and as part of the ongoing efforts, are there any um, activities to, or plans to grow the project in new areas such as uh, investing in support of constraint device. And this is a question coming from the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to find the question. Uh, is this from Stefano Fabri? Um, it is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that there are kind of uh, silicon sub organizations on the foundation. Uh, yeah. 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 So mainly we're 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 thinking of the foundation and the stakeholders are very interested in growing PyTorch and the ecosystem. Like I I think the foundation was such a natural transition that I don't expect us to do anything more or less than we were already doing. Uh, but what I do expect PyTorch to continue being doing is like increase its uh, coverage for hardware backends, uh, a, a, like increase uh, 
um, like like introduce various uh, state of the art compiler technology. Like we're going to be doing a bunch of this stuff, uh, and we're going to be working very closely with various um, stakeholders who are best at doing that. Like you know, we we, we want to work closely with AMD, Nvidia, Intel. Um, a bunch of the other like hardware startups like even Google for TPU, but also like Cerebras, Graphor, um, Habana, um, San Manova. I mean, like we, we want to work with everyone uh, in defining what is like their entry point in creating a PyTorch backend. And so that if a user comes in and they're like, oh, I want to use PyTorch and like I have this accelerator, we're like, yeah, it's ready, right? So like we want to continue doing that. We want to integrate with PyTorch as a first class uh, smooth integration with all the cloud provider tooling, like you know, launch like a PyTorch distributed job on a thousand GPUs on AWS. Like, is that well, like, is that smooth? Is that like well oiled? Like, and like we work closely with AWS, GCP, Azure on aspects like these. Um, all these things will continue and like we have so many other dimensions that we're working on as well like these are just uh the cloud providers and hardware vendors but we expect to um um do a lot of new product development um add, uh, to catch up with the with the field uh and where we're not doing as well so we expect to do all of these things pretty much uh i think it's a very broad answer i i, I didn't really give an opinion but that's that's roughly how we're thinking. Yeah, and I, and I think you know, pointing people to the GitHub org and to you know, like the roadmap information on GitHub would kind of give them a starting point to know what's happening and you know, what's coming uh, as new features into the project. Um, yeah. So we have uh, a question from uh, Surav Das um, about the availability of uh, training. Um, for PyTorch. And I'm just gonna take a little stab at the question. Um, about two weeks ago, when we announced the transitioning of the project to the PyTorch Foundation, uh, the Linux Foundation and PyTorch Foundation announced a new course that is available for free from the Linux Foundation catalog of courses. The course is uh, PyTorch for uh, uh, AI uh, decision makers. Uh, that's a free course. And we are actually uh, in the progress uh, to uh, creating new content and new courses to be made available uh, via our LFX uh, platform via the Linux Foundation for anyone interested to learn about PyTorch. Uh, so this is definitely a, a priority to make that knowledge and that training available to as many people as possible. Uh, and of course, uh, Sumit, just I think this is a priority for you too, and you know for all the participant companies in in the PyTorch Foundation. Yeah. Um, I'll take a quick stab at answering some of the other uh, questions. So, uh, will there be better support for non-NVIDIA hardware by OpenCL? OpenCL itself, uh, probably no. We uh, There's a GitHub issue. You can look at a search on the PyTorch issues, search for OpenCL, it'll pop up. But like, we, OpenCL is something that in, the, in my like, fairly opinionated answer, Something that all the hardware companies embraced, but embraced poorly. Like none of them support OpenCL well. Like if you actually go look at the code path, it, like the, the just the driver latency, like just the like how long did it take to launch an OpenCL kernel? You know, something as fundamental as that is just not very good. And then none of the companies are committed to fixing that over time. Uh, and we know this, we talked to the companies, like we ran down the OpenCL path pretty seriously at some point. Uh, so not OpenCL, but like all these companies, the reason they're not supporting OpenCL uh, as much is because they all have their own software stacks that they're like optimizing. It's like a key differentiator for, for them. Like they're trying to create value via their own like closed source uh, or like in some cases just proprietary uh software stacks you know some of them are open source but proprietary so we're trying to integrate with those because that's what the hardware vendors want to work on with us um that, that's like a very pragmatic thing uh the reason i uh, bring this up is because there's a lot of conspiracy theories uh on the github issues about why we don't work with opencl 
uh, and we want to like have hardware vendor X or Y uh, be favorited or something. That's not true. Like we we tried very hard to work uh, to get OpenZL support, and it just the hardware vendors privately are just not very enthusiastic about fixing all the issues uh, there are there. Publicly, I'm sure they're going to put a brave face about it. Um, will there be increased coordinations with other Linux Foundation projects, such as Onyx, uh, Chaos? Well, we already like work pretty closely with Onyx. Uh, we have maintainers who who are working on PyTorch Onyx integration and stuff. I don't think it's going to be a function of whether these two projects are Linux Foundation projects or not. I don't think we're going to have any kind of connections being made because they're Linux Foundation projects, but we will work with like whatever makes sense pretty much. Um, why Spider is the most loved deep learning framework? I would actually say I wouldn't call it the most loved deep learning framework. I think it's just one of the more popular frameworks. I just don't want to categorically say that's the most or anything like that. Like the, the numbers don't always support it. Like it's it's used a lot in some segments such as research. It's not used as much in other segments. So like, I, <laughs> I'm i gonna just answer the question by just saying, I don't know if I even agree with the premise, but like I try to cover uh, some of the reasons why PyTorch is loved and uh, lower barrier of entry around packaging, user experience and documentation and backward compatibility. Just ease, ease of use of the API is just like, we call this eager mode, which is like what you run is what you get. And it's just like very easy to reason about. Those are all the things I think that um, I think of. Um, ML had a question. I'm wondering then, wouldn't it be the way that we can or some other companies resources and donates it to the foundation? I think, uh, I think, uh, this is not, so the reality ML, and I'll try to uh, answer it as candidly as possible, is uh, when a company thinks of making a donation versus uh, when, it, when a company thinks of uh, having something funded internally for its own needs, you get very different numbers. <laughs> the companies would be open to donating $50,000 a year but not $5 million a year. But if the same company has to build like a team internally or some funding internally uh, or for say having contractors uh, do some of this work, say from Quonsai, the budgets are like way bigger. So yeah. um, I don't think this donation model works as well. Of course, over time, like if uh, the, like one of the things we're trying to work on with the foundation is try to figure out if the foundation can just be more sustainably sourced, right? Like whether the, the resource that it gets can over time build maybe things like um, grants or funding and things like that. But we're very, we're very far away from that. Like we want to get there, but it's not easy. And like the way you pose it currently is not really possible just from the reality of how companies work, especially publicly traded companies. Um, hopefully I answered that as, with candidly as I can, because like this, this gets lost uh, a lot when people just think about it without having the context. Like you, you like go to like your CTO or your, uh, you know, your, your funding, and you ask for like five million dollars for donating to NumPy. They're just gonna laugh you out of the room. It doesn't matter how big the company is. That's just the reality of the situation. Um. I think we're kind of at time. Um, yep. So I'll try to pick um, particular questions. Um, I think the license of Fight for Source Code is already, like it's, you can check it out. Uh, so I'm not gonna answer that. Um, Full-time contributors we have, I, as I estimated already, we have about, I would say 400 to 500 across the world. Uh, like. Uh, full-time contributors out of which around 200-ish are at Meta uh, and there's like 30 to 50, like, there's like 
two to fifth person teams at various other companies that all maybe add up uh, to the rest. Maybe I'm uh, maybe closer to 400. Uh, that's roughly how, how I would estimate. Uh, I don't expect the forecast to be any different. Like I think roughly uh, we might grow linearly. Um, so maybe I'll, we'll see like the 10%, 15% growth over time, but I don't expect, I don't know. Like, I think it's important to talk about full-time contributors or what, like for the core PyTorch project, I don't expect us to have more than linear growth, but like the PyTorch ecosystem is expanding exponentially and it will continue. So I think ecosystem contributors by building their own projects or building value in the community are as important and that stuff is like expanding crazily so i i i just want to make that differentiation um yeah so i think maybe we should end here because we're out of time. yeah so um uh, thank you very much everyone who attended this live um and thank you very much summit and the meta and pytorch and linux foundation team for putting this together uh, i believe this will be uh recorded or it is recorded and will be posted online at some point and i pass it back to the event organizer at the linux foundation thank you Thank you both so much for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.